but this is like really awesome. It's um, it's a whole different thing in person, isn't it? It is. It's great. <laughs> it's really great. The whole thing is uh, it takes on a life of its own. Oh, of course, then this doesn't work now, so that's going to be a whole thing, which means I have to do this, and everything is a freaking to-do. Oh, hi. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Late Night Playset. My name is Jay Ryan. We have a great guest for you this evening. Mr. Sean Cridlin is here. I'm looking at him right now. I would turn the camera on him and show him to you. I'll do it from here from the desk, I guess. There he is. There he is. He looks a little bit like Letterman. So maybe we're getting warmed up over here for the real day. But I'm not sure. But Mrs. Ryan's here. We're going to talk about the weekend and um, something else I can't remember. <laughs> we're doing a TBT and uh, some GVBC stuff. And that's what we're doing tonight. And Mr. Sean Cridlin, the author of Hello, we've got all the volumes over here. The Brumos, an American racing icon. Also, we know him from the Hurley book as well. So we're going to be talking to him and everything else tonight with you and your questions on Instagram. More to come as we start the show. Watch this video from Good Vibes Breakfast Club and pay no attention to me wandering over here to press the button as I would have cut away to do it. You trim your beard. You look great. And he did a shave. Everybody looks great. Welcome back, Mrs. Ryan. Welcome here for the first time, Sean. Well, thank you. <laughs> oh, man, this is exciting. Hey, everybody on Instagram. Sorry about that. It was a late start. I'm uh, <clears throat> out of breath, a little sweaty. <laughs> We're all going to settle down here in a second. I had a sip of water. We'll take a nice couple deep breaths here. <sighs> Why well, that always helps me personally. I'll put the Instagram audience in the show here. There we go. Good to see Nicole Un Good Spirits. <laughs> damn straight because she can't walk for the damn <laughs> nope. it was a chore getting into the studio today in fact it was so bad that i took video of it because i <laughs> that sounds terrible <laughs> <laughs> no i mean more on the lines of like documentation like you know we're starting a foundation for nicole and uh, not for nicole for the world but um using nicole's name and uh, and an ailment and uh and this is the type of thing we're gonna need so i took video of it thanks <laughs> You can see it back if you want to. No need. If not. Uh, okay. Tonight is Thursday, December 9th, 2021. It's not only Tradecraft Thursday. Let's get Mrs. Ryan fired up over here with her uh, medication for said MS. Multiple sclerosis, if you don't know. It's a real bastard of a thing. You're on year 10 or 11 of it. 10? 11. So 10. Be, you're 11. in. 
It's been 10 years. You were yeah. in your 11th year. Right. Yeah, since diagnosis. And in the beginning, it was like some blurry spots in your eye and like not quite as... You, your heels weren't quite this tall anymore. Actually, they were probably at least that tall in the I old days. I still wore foreign shields. I yeah. was... I, I looked fine. Like it was, I thought I had mascara and then eyelash lost in my eyes somewhere. I remember being in a bar at a hotel, a hotel bar with you and a client. Who was it? Nick Swartzen in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And you fell in the lobby and oh, they yeah. wouldn't let you into the bar because they thought you were wasted. wasted already. They're like, she can't come in here. She's plastered. And I was like, here's the thing. <laughs> you don't want this trouble. <laughs> she may be a little intoxicated, but she also has MS. You don't want to deny her entry. <laughs> Uh, but that was a that was a weird night. But that was in the very very beginning. My God, you were still working. We were still traveling. Yeah. That was like after that. Oh God, that guy, I think about that. It was like, oh no, it's all crumbling around us nowadays. Oh my God, nothing was wrong yet. <laughs> nothing at all. And I acted as if nothing was. And well, that was your thing. That was your thing. You weren't allowed to have problems. All Correct. everyone around you had problems, so you weren't allowed to. Correct. Uh, that is uh, what was that? What'd you, what'd you have there? Was it okay? Yes. All right. Ghost Train uh, by the Sticky Vape people, our friends and neighbors across the hall there over at uh, Sticky Vape in the Arts District downtown. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to our friends at Tradecraft Farms who keeps Mrs. Ryan medicated, especially with the, uh, the stickies there. Uh, okay. Let's see. We talked about that. Uh, our guest, I already told you, is Sean Cridlin. We're going to get him in here as quick as possible, as quickly as possible. This weekend, man, oh man, oh man, is there a lot of stuff to do this weekend? And I'm hoping maybe you can help me figure out some of the stuff. We have four things to do on Saturday. I don't imagine we're going to hit four things. Um, I mean, I could maybe hit four things. I don't know how. That just seems cruel and inhuman to try <laughs> to try to force you to do. <laughs> I'm luckily like I, the one thing I will ab go along with, like people at breakfast club treat me like a dog. Like I can. Be put anywhere. That's the one thing I have in common with all the dogs. I don't sleep as it is, so it doesn't matter where I am, and I always hurt, so it doesn't matter where I am, so it's fine regardless. Ray Schaefer says hello. Hi, Ray. <laughs> Ray Schaefer, your friend Sean says hello as well. He'll be in here in just a couple minutes. Um, good evening there, Jay and Nicole from Paul Novotny. Uh, okay, well, here we go. Um, you know, Saturday morning. Well, for, first of all, tomorrow's Breakfast Club. Of course, that's happening. Whatever. And then we could rest up theoretically all day afterwards, although all day afterwards ends up being like 3 or 4 p.m. We get home so late nowadays. We're up there till 2.30. Breakfast Club became hang out all day in the mountain. Yeah, it's a thing. <clears throat> so Saturday morning, there's the, the small one up in Beverly, Beverly Glen that we like to do. Classic Cars und Cafe. <laughs> now, that's really low-key. That's easy, right? That's like a roll out of bed thing. Bring, right. your, bring your coffee. Then we have the purist group thing. Now, that's huge. I mean, that's like maybe the, one of the biggest things going in Los Angeles. Huge winter drive. Okay? Mm -hmm. So call it one from 7 to 9. Call it like that. Something like that. 7 to 8. 7.30 to 9.30. This other one, 10 to 3. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there's a birth, uh, excuse me, a Christmas holiday party uh, that, we, uh, that he's in town for. And I don't know if we're allowed to say or not. I mean, it's public knowledge, isn't it? Yeah, Lisa Taylor's having a holiday party, or annual, or biannual, whatever it is. Every an, every other annual holiday party that you have, uh, uh, they're they're hosting a lovely thing. But that's, you know, from three till whenever. And then there's Andrew Florence thing in Brentwood on Saturday night. Now I don't see, just some of those things overlap a little bit. So I don't see doing all of them, but energetically, and they're all, they're also all in completely different geographical that's locations. That's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. No, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> it's all over the joint. Is there any of those things that you really, really would like to hit? We have to do the purest thing. Or I, by the way, I have to do the purest thing. You don't have to do anything. None of these are mandatory for you. The first thing you said and the purest thing and the Andrew's thing sound easy enough for me. The, the, I, know, I except... love Lisa so much, but like I can't roll easily on that terrain. Yeah, it, it's somewhere it's somewhere else. Don't prejudge it, um, but then okay. you wouldn't go to Andrews either because I'll be at Lisa's and I'm not going to come uh, home to go back down. to It doesn't make any sense. Also, 
you think you have enough energy, but by the time you get back from the purist group, you're done for the day. <laughs> this is why I have you to tell me when I well, no, don't. I don't. I don't want to be like that because I don't want to. I don't ever want to be the guy. Told you, don't tell me what I can't do. Damn it! You know what I mean. I always want to try to get you to do as much stuff as possible, but I also, I'm also on the other end of that playing mop up too when you don't have enough energy. So yeah. Uh, Hank on camera four is here. Thank God we were down a camera. Good, good grief. <laughs> Chris Florence here. Hello, Jay, Nicole, and Sean. Oh, that's right. Well, Chris Florence, I heard, may have uh, he contributed to your book and maybe yes. even took the picture that I posted today for his promotion of his appearance. Very cool. It was an old picture at Riverside, I believe, of oh, uh, yeah. 59, yeah. 935. Yeah, nice yeah. So cool. What a great little community we have here. <sighs> All right. So we'll figure out the weekend. You're going to do at least some of those things, though. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. I'd like to. That's wonderful. All right. Oh, okay. So, good news, bad news. <laughs> it, it doesn't affect anybody. It's only for me. Good news, bad news. Bad news for me. It's embarrassing more than anything else. All right. So, I told you the other day about the Smoking Tire podcast we did with the Everyday Driver guys, mm -hmm. Todd and Paul. Remember what I told you I thought might have happened because of the thing and then the stools and the, the chirons were done ahead of time and then when they sat down, I don't think I changed whatever the – anyway, that's apparently what happened. <laughs> apparently – here's the good news. That show went up today. I told you it was going to be next week. It's out now. You can go check it out right now on YouTube or the Patreon if you're into the smoking tire uh, universe there. Um, but Todd and Paul, I'm so sorry to you guys, the everyday drivers. I, I guess I didn't – you know, it's all very small, and I was into the conversation, whatever, and I was just kind of putting up things where they were, whatever. I guess they were on the wrong sides. Everything's spelled right, everything's good, but the wrong guys are the wrong name, <laughs> whatever the fuck. I told them they sat in the wrong stools, so put it on them. It happened. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, it was a really fun hour and a half uh, where we talked about all sorts of things, um, the adventures they're up to with their used former exotic cars uh, and everything else that they do. It's a, it's a really good time. Um, and Matt's known them for a long time, so they, they were able to go deep. It was a lot of fun. Oh, and then that's why I'm wearing this shirt, by the way. Okay, so during that episode of uh, The Smoking Tire, we talked about this shirt. This is the shirt from Matt Ferris Friday. Uh, uh, excuse me. For <laughs> Get your shit together. <laughs> Woo! 40th birthday party the other day. And this is um, a design that cartoons actually did, Steve. But uh, Hannah, Matt's wife, put together a whole beautiful party, a band, a whole thing. It was a, 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 at a, a really fun place, and we everybody got these shirts. It was really, really cool. These are now available. We thought they were going to be limited edition. We're like, oh, cool, we got these for the party. Oh, I'm going to keep it for Oh, it's really fun. Now they're available to everybody. So if you want one of these shirts, go get one. Uh, support the smoking tire. Go to Blip Shift. Uh, I think the only difference is it doesn't have the F40 on the back for, for trademark reasons. You know, they did that for this because of the Farrah 40. I mean, it's too it's too good and too... Like, how do you do this and not it's, do that? You were there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good point. <laughs> Cut me off. That's great. Okay. <laughs> GVBC tomorrow. All right. GVBC last week was huge because of Sean Lee and the Purist Group Drive and uh, 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 Toy Drive and everything. Everybody from everywhere came out of the woodwork, right? There was nowhere to park at Newcombs. People were walking up from Chileo. <laughs> with their big teddy bears and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this week, I anticipate because of that, there's going to be, oh, a lot of hubbub. Everybody's going to want to come up. I want to just warn you that the weather is not how it was last week. It, it's it's cold and rainy today, which means it's it's going, the mountain's going to change overnight. If you're not familiar with that area, it doesn't make sense to you. You don't understand the nature and the how it all, it's, it's weird. The, the, the mountain breathes, it expands, it breathes, it, 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 it's alive. It's alive. Yeah. I, I, I hesitated to actually say that because, okay, whatever. It's alive. It's part of the earth. That's the thing. And it breathes and it moves. And With that, rocks, rock slides, all sorts of different things, debris, um, things that weren't there 15 minutes ago might be there now and vice versa. Um, you know, that's how we hit a rock a couple months ago. Um, that and it's going to be cold. So areas in the shadies, if you grew up in LA and all of a sudden you're driving around and it, you know, it's 65 degrees down here at the bottom, but you're driving up there and you hit an area of just going through shade, it happens to be black ice up there potentially. And all of a sudden you don't, <laughs> it's a whole different situation. You're off before you, it's like Jurassic Park. <laughs> what do you mean? Like if you shot yourself in the foot, he's like, yeah, he goes, don't do that. You'd be dead before you knew you had an accident. Um, there's no margin for error up there. It's not like Malibu. Um, 
you got to respect the crest. It's that simple. Uh, and we don't want to lose any friends and anybody who's trying to be our friend. So respect the crest tomorrow morning. Please, please, please. Extra caution. That's all. That's all. That's just for me. I'm not telling anybody what to do. I don't want to be that guy. But, you know, we are saying, hey, we're coming up here. And uh, if you want to come, you should come. And it's not like a liability thing. It's more of a... It's a good message. Yeah, it's like a universal karma. Like, oh, man, if you're coming up to see us, I want to make sure we all have good vibes and and hang with each other. And it's not, oh, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? Oh, my God. Oh, I hope they're okay. I love that you say that because people forget. It's easy. I forget all the time. Not actually driving. You do all the work, but like... I forget, too. It's It's easy to forget. It's yeah, it goes out of your head immediately, so I'm glad you say it. People always go, you could be dead tomorrow. I was like, check that, son. You could be dead today. You could be dead five minutes from now. Nobody ever thinks about it. Maybe it might happen right now. Should we, should we sit and wait? <laughs> Everybody, pull, pull, pull your chair real close to the set or your, uh, your device. How old am I? Pull your oh chair close God. to the TV oh set. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Can't make it in flat Florida. Oh, man. Heading down to Carson tomorrow from Monterey. Fun snake bites. I'm assuming you're going to go to the PEC. Is that what you're doing? That'll be fun. Anyway, I don't think it's going to be that bad, quite frankly. I think actually all of this will make it. It's like bringing an umbrella. I think if everyone's really cautious, the conditions are going to be great in the morning. I really believe that, Uh, especially because Caltrans District 7 does such a great job with sweeping the road for us on Friday mornings. They're pretty amazing. Yes. Um, so that's what's going on. Down. GBBC, there's the merch, of course. Go to Dual Shift. I don't want to hold all that stuff up. I want to get a guest in here. But I do want to play a TBT video for you, which is of GBBC. Okay. Okay? Okay. Sound good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> how are you feeling today? I told everybody you weren't walking good, but how, how are you? Today's not good. Yesterday was good. Better than, no, no. Was it two days ago? Two days ago was really good. How'd you walk yesterday? Pretty good. Pretty good. So you had like two good days. Because the weekend, you were wiped out from Breakfast Club. On Friday, you were I wiped out Saturday and Sunday. I was exhausted, but functional. I could make myself move, and then yesterday and today, I cannot. How did you feel about sharing a little bit more than usual on the show on Tuesday? I didn't watch it back, but I, I remember you doing it. I'm so happy you did. I'm glad you did, because it tailors what I say, because otherwise I have diary of the mouth, and I'll just talk with no direction. No, but I'm at... I, I, well, I, I felt you shared more than usual on Tuesday's show, and I'm 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 very grateful that you did because I think it lets people into what your world is really like versus what it looks like or what people think it's like. I loved it, and I'm glad you reined me in because I can't. <laughs> All right, I'm trying not to rein you in. I'm trying to get you to say something. <laughs> you're reining yourself in. <laughs> you're, I'm not saying it the right way. You corral me in a way that lets me talk properly. Oh. So otherwise, I'll just talk on tangents all random. So I'm. Well, you need your own podcast. Remember, that was the whole start of this whole thing. You yeah, were going to have a podcast. Yeah, and then I stopped being able to talk. <laughs> like We're getting a new mixer. Whole... We'll have all spare equipment for everything, anything you want to do. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I can form words, I'll let you know. You can form the words. You're doing okay. Your head, your brain works. You know what I mean? You, you're, you're fighting to keep that going. And everything else will fall in line as, as I believe you heal yourself, which I believe you can do as you're doing this inner work. I don't know that you're going to be great doing jumping jacks and jumping out of planes again and stuff like that. But I do definitely think that your situation in daily life I'll is going to improve. I'll be functional again. Like I'm figuring out what does what. Like So I know that this week right now i'm a little low energy and mood wise like now i know what why that happens easier sometimes so i'm it's a weird thing once you know it's easier to confront and deal with things you're a warrior battling something that none of us know about every single day and i think it would be perfectly understandable for any warrior to get tired from time to time don't beat yourself up. I really don't like to be, apparently. When I'm around other people, I have no problem being tired and ridiculous when I'm by myself. But that is rarer and rarer because I'm not functional and around people. Like, it's really bad. I think you're, I think you do it okay. Thanks. Don't beat yourself up, seriously. Uh, all right, TBT, right? Yes. GVBC, roll it how? Oh, and hang on, hang on. Come back to the studio. Just one moment. Uh, I, I forgot. We're doing the East Coast feed. And then also we have a video from Auto Kennel that I'll play after. 
because they're starting the Coastal Rain Rally, I believe it is. Whatever, there's a rally they just started today. So yeah, he's, he sent in a video as they're coming in through LA. Okay, all right. Okay. So, so this is the TBT first. <laughs> I just want to, I didn't want you to think we were done, folks. It's this and one, okay? <laughs> Roll it out. <laughs> Like this video and come out every Friday. Goodbye. Do you remember that? It was longer ago than I thought it was. I remember the cupcake, not the rest of it. The Elmo cupcake. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was so good. I'm sure it was, but those ones with their faces always bother me. I didn't When I was a kid and you had to bite the head off an Easter rabbit, I didn't like that either. But the looking. face of Elmo, like, ah, you're eating a Muppet's face. Maybe that's <laughs> the good thing about being shaky. Like, I can't look at anything. So I... <laughs> that's terrible. I've got to laugh at something. Amen. Amen to that. I know what you mean. Uh, that was fun. That was fun. It was great to see everybody. Most of those people were there the other day, but that looked like a low chill one compared to what Breakfast Club is like these days. Yeah. <laughs> it was like the early days. All right. Uh, I can't remember the rally, but I'm sure Paul Kellner will tell us uh, what's going on. He's good at that. Ready? Yes. Roll it, Hal. Take it away, Paul Kellner from the road. Howdy, uh, Jay and Nicole Ryan. This is Paul Kennel from behind the orange curtain. It's been a while. Actually, now in LA, uh, we, myself and my friend Lewis Ike from New Jersey, are right now driving up to the Driving Well Awesome Coastal Range Rally Classic that starts tomorrow from Carmel. And, uh, probably wondering why it's raining in Southern California and I apologize that's my fault um, I didn't have time to clean my La Tortuga so I ordered some rain and uh, I'm gonna miss you guys at Goodbye's Breakfast Club tomorrow uh, I'm wondering if it'll be some snow dusting uh, that's exciting but I'm bummed because my back way from Wrightwood means it'll probably be closed until next year, which is bummer. Uh, that's my little autocross track. Anyway, love you guys. Have a great, uh, good vibes. Miss you, and uh, follow my feed, and you'll see our shenanigans with vintage cars driving in bad weather on twisty roads. What could go wrong? Love you guys. <laughs> Oh, shenanigans? Oh, I love shenanigans. You mean shenanigans? <laughs> I love that guy. That guy's like my brother. I don't, I can't explain why. I guess I'm, I guess we're just the same amount of weird or the same flavor or same frequency of weirdness. <laughs> Maybe, because I love him too. Like, he makes me so great. happy. I don't know why. I think he's a goof, but I think I'm a goof. I, I just, I feel like we're related somehow. You guys have similar senses of humor, I find. 
<laughs> he couldn't have had different upbringings. <laughs> at, they're so polar opposite, but like, like he's the, the dad joke guy, like you just saw. Oh and, yeah, big time. But dad you, joke. Well, because the Ed, the Ed is the dad joke. Totally, guy. but you get on with them. When I saw You're a picture, dad, uh, Paul Kendall posted a picture the other day of him as a kid with his dad, and I swear to God, they look the freaking same. I mean, clearly one's a kid and the dad's a lot younger, but they look the same. They're the same shapes. They're the same. <laughs> Everything is the same. <laughs> uh, so don't forget to shop smart. Better call Paul <laughs> from the Auto Kramers down there at the Auto Kennel. And uh, do we do all the stuff? I can do some commercials now. Speaking of, speaking of speaking of shopping smart, <laughs> they say all that separates men and boys is the coverage for their toys. St. Clair Insurance has coverage for your toys, Mrs. Ryan. What kind of toys are we talking about? Collector cars and all their subsidiaries. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> the cars, the garages, the homes, the businesses, all of that stuff is insurable. And uh, St. Clair Insurance Shop's top provider, so you get the best coverage. If I were you, I'd go to St. Clair Insurance <laughs> by visiting coverageforyourtoys.com. 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 And I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that the best <laughs> bubbles in the world are made by Bubble Tree, the American Bubble Company. Did I turn the bubbles on before? Or did I totally forget? <laughs> I you think I forgot. forgot. <laughs> there was too much going on. <laughs> Well, you can get yourself one of these little canisters, or if you order yourself up one of these talk show kits from Amazon, it comes with one of these, and then you just fall from the ceiling when you push a button on your table, which is pretty exciting. It takes a second to warm up, though. This is definitely quicker. Um, but look at this. It keeps on lasting through the entire holiday season, so... <laughs> and now, on behalf of Nicole Ryan. No. Hello. This is Jay Ryan on behalf of Nicole Ryan from Late Night Playset, reminding you to please like, subscribe, and comment below. This feeds the internet algorithm and eventually Nicole as well. <laughs> Be a pal. Like, subscribe, and comment below. It'll be fire. And I pushed the button too late, but here comes the smoke that denotes the fire that it'll be from people commenting. It's happening right now. I think, I think our smoke juice is over. It's not quite as thick as it used to be. Do you notice that? Yeah, <laughs> it's I do. It's been a dud the last couple of times. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Problems for another day. We're going to shut down for the holidays. We're going to rewire some stuff. It's going to be all sorts of goodness in here. I guess I'll just check out the smoke machine and the fog machine and the bubble <laughs> machine and all that stuff while we're at it. Uh, did I do all the stuff? Are we good? I think Are so. you good? Did you say everything you need to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to take a quick break. Some comedic words from our friends at Oh So Delicious Hot Sauce. The hot sauce, Mrs. Ryan. Made by bears. <laughs> made by bears. And then Sean Cridlin's going to be sitting in that chair when we come back. Right after this, Oh So Delicious Hot Sauce. More to come with Sean Cridlin. <laughs> oh So Delicious. It's a hot sauce made by bears. Garlic and serrano. Mixed with love and care You can put it on your eggs Pour it on your rice It's great on a leg It's better on a slice It's oh so delicious It's a hot sauce made by bears Oh so delicious hot sauce Great on everything except oatmeal Get your bottle today at ohsodelicious.org One dollar from every bottle sold Goes to the National Military Family Association I'm Johnny Lieberman, and you're watching LMP. What does LMP stand for? Late Night Play. Oh, yeah, that's true. I've been on there. Yeah, good show. <laughs> you should like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. There you go. What are you driving today? 63 356B. Right. Hey, 111. What are you driving today? Here we go.
And then that's the Instagram audience over there. Oh, very cool. And then the rest of us with this music right here. <laughs> yeah. We are back. We're back. I will kill this echo over here so we don't all go nuts. And uh, the angle on that's going to kill me. So I'm going to introduce you to Mrs. Ryan over here and say hello and have you guys say hello while I just go change that so it's not quite so like this. Hi, Sean, Mrs. Ryan. Hello. <laughs> How long are you here? I'm here just for the weekend. No way. Yeah, and I came down to go to some of the same events that you guys are going to this weekend. And I just thought, well, this is the perfect time. And, uh, you know, we tried to get together uh, for Hurley's book. And that didn't ever quite work out. And no. I just thought, well, I'll give it another shot. I'm happy you're here. Me too. Me too. I'm extremely happy to, to be here. I'm happy to meet you, I guess, because it's been a long t time. The Hurley book was two, three years ago. Three years ago. Wow. Yeah. So it's been since then that we've been trying to do this. So I guess of all the people, other than Letterman himself, you're probably the long, the longest. <laughs> <laughs> like Zwart was like a year, you know. But I think you're probably the longest, uh, whatever, in flux. Wow. Is it everything you hoped it would be? <laughs> it, it's everything I hoped and more. I mean, it's really incredible. I'm, I'm so happy. This is very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you brought the book with you. We'll talk all about that. But I want to know a little bit about you. Um, I don't know that much. I know that when we were trying to get you here for the Hurley book, you go, well, you don't want me. You really want Hurley. And we were like, no, I think, I think, we, I think we want you. I think we want you. Um, I find you fascinating. I find your energy great already. And you look like Letterman. So come on. <laughs> well, um, you know, I grew up in a family in which my dad was into sports cars and skiing. And um, my, when I was a kid, my dad had an MGB and a Triumph TR4A, and th those were our two family cars that he and my mom and I would ride around in. And uh, I, grew, I grew up going to Watkins Glen and Lime Rock oh. during the days of the classic Can-Am and Trans-Am and Formula One. Um, and, uh, but I was also very much into the skiing part of it. And so when I turned 18, I, uh, s I skipped out, uh, didn't go to college like they had grilled me uh, for doing forever, and went to Aspen for a winter, which turned into 15 years. <laughs> and, uh, but while where was, were you on the East Coast? I grew up in upstate New York in uh -huh. uh, the southern edge of the Adirondacks. Rochester and ah. Connecticut. Okay, so uh, Johnstown, New York area. Yeah, know it. Yes, when yep. you said Watkins and Lime Rock, I was like, "Well, wait, wait yeah. a second. We probably have a lot more in common." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, uh, when I was a teenager, I was running around in the Adirondack High Peak area. I'm an Adirondack 46er. That was one of my first wow. achievements. And I uh, canoe raced and all those great canoe races up there: the Hudson River Whitewater Derby and the and the uh, General Clinton 70 Mile Race and all those kinds of crazy things when I was a teenager. And then, uh, you know, I moved to Aspen, was a ski bum for a long time. I got involved in a sport called speed skiing, which is skiing over 120 miles an hour. Wait, what? Uh, whoa, wait, whoa. <laughs> I, first of all, I was thinking most skiing is speed skiing. I mean, you're generally in some sort of competition to get to the bottom of the hill the quickest. What on earth are you doing to achieve 120 miles an hour? So speed skiing is kind of like the Bonneville of ski racing. And they prepare a special track that's, uh, that's smooth and straight. And you wear all this really cool aerodynamic uh, stuff, like your helmet is all fared into your body, and you wear fins on the back of your legs and stuff like that. Oh. And uh, and my speed back in 1986 was 126 miles an hour when the record was 129. Holy smokes! And but then, it's just downhill in a straight line then to achieve that. Is that yeah, what yeah? So you're dealing basically with all aero stuff and um, you know and side winds or you know whatever is you know. But like a maybe the what is the the rake like a ski jump without the lip? Yes, or? it's very steep. Holy very crap, steep. It's you're practically crazy. free fall. How old were you? Yeah. <laughs> I was in my late twenties and uh, oh, well, you're still malleable then. Yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry and to then, get hung uh, up on that, but <laughs> and then you know the one thing <laughs> that a, a, lot, too. <laughs> a lot of people know me for from that period is that uh, uh, speed skiers often trained on top of cars. Like, you know, the Europeans would train on top of fast cars on the Autostrada or the Autobahn or stuff like that. And somebody eventually, uh, a guy from Finland named Kalevi Hakkinen said, well, I'll get more sponsors if I have a record doing that. And so he did it. And and then, if, you know, a few other is people it, did it. To achieve the arrow, is that what? To achieve was, the speeds? To, to work on your arrow, oh, yeah. The crack yeah. Nuts, right? Like, That's so, yeah. so crazy. So and then, uh, and then you eventually you yourself on? Like, yeah, you yeah. So they were just in ski racks. You know, they would put their skis in ski racks and then climb up on top of the oh. car. And, 
And oh. then eventually there were a couple of guys who uh, set a record on top of one of Tom Walkinshaw's Jaguars in Britain. And they were the kind of guys that I just, we just always kind of ground on each other a little bit. And at the end of that winter, I went home and I made some phone calls. The first call was to Hot Rod Magazine and said, tell me something about Bonneville, anything. And say so they said, oh, well, call the Utah Salt Flats Racing Association. So I called them and I said, well, I've got this thing and I want to do this record on top of a car. Was, they said, oh, well, Rick Vesco is helping a guy named John Howard set a motorcycle, or a motor a motor-paced bicycle record. Uh, so you should call him and ask him what, if he would be interested. So I called him, and he said, well, come on over to the house. And, and Rick, the Vesco family, I didn't know at the time, but the Vesco family had been racing at Bonneville since the 30s. And the car that I saw when I went to his house was like 25 feet long and about three feet wide and about three feet high and had many records. And he said, uh, so how fast do you want to go? And I said, well... You know, right now the record for that's 125. And he said, well, you know, this car's been over 300 miles an hour many times. How fast do you want to go? <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> I don't know, uh, maybe 160, that could do it. And uh, so anyway, a few months later, we went out to the Salt Flats and, uh, and uh, I, I went 162, 162 miles an hour on top of uh, Rick Vesco's car, and that was the record that I set in 1985, and it still stands. Oh, my God. <laughs> but oh, these other guys were on station wagons and shit like that, and you were on a, on a Bonneville car. Oh, yeah. I don't even know how you – I mean, it wasn't on a ski rack. <laughs> no, no. He uh, he built a special sub-chassis that went up, and then he built a special body over oh, top of that, like and then f- he bolted the skis uh, directly to the, oh, the sub-chassis. So you and weren't then touching I, the actual fuselage of the uh, – the, the car. The, the skis were. The skis oh, were bolted were. on. And then I stepped into the bindings. So I was just in the bindings. Uh, and then You were just shape. as nuts as those guys. So, I mean, it's death. If Any incident <laughs> equals death, basically. Oh, oh, for sure, yeah. If I had oh. flinched, if I had moved a pinky, um, I would have flown off the back of the car. And, the arrow yeah. at that at that speed. I used to yeah. fly a little bit. You put your hand out the window when oh, you're sure. flying a Cessna, yeah. and all of a sudden it's yeah. crazy. Wow. So any wow. kind of imbalance, it would have, you know. That was one of the cool things when, I, when Hurley and I started work on his book, because He's like, you're even crazier than yeah. me. <laughs> right. You need your own book. Who's going to write your book? That's what we need. Oh, bro. Well, that must feel good. You're writing a book about somebody like Hurley, and he goes, ah, you know what? You're pretty interesting yourself, son. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's, uh, it, it's, it's helped me to get a lot of street cred with the racing crowd, I have to say. Yeah. Well, I think your books have done that. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Or at least too. the Hurley yeah. book is the one that people yeah. uh, know. This is very an- yeah. uh, highly anticipated. Is it out or when is it coming? Oh, it's gosh. This, out? this has been kind of a nightmare scenario where <laughs> uh, we, uh, myself and uh, Richard Barron is my designer, and Richard designs Porsche Panorama magazine, and he oh. was also at uh, Road and Track for 30 years before that. And he helped me with Hurley's book, and then. So he and I set out to do this book actually in July of 2019 and worked literally around the clock for two years to get this thing done and we got it all ready for the printer and then uh you know we had a scenario where right at the last minute the printer decided to drop us because of uh, you know all the covid stuff oh, great. we had to beg yeah. them to take us back and then they pushed us into september and now they're pushing us into december just on you know uh, the books themselves are done but the printing for the slipcase part of the thing sure. uh, won't get done until december 21st and mm. The slipcase guy's ready, and the box guy's ready, but... Uh, so the holidays came and went. Oh, that, yeah. was, uh, that was a gut punch I'm for sorry. me. Yeah, that was a gut punch. Well, luckily, I think the car people are evergreen, and um, yeah. you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> the giving I season so. may pass, yeah. but <laughs> the yeah. I want it doesn't. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a phenomenal book, and, and that's, for me, the hardest part, really. It's not any of the dates or anything like that. It's that the content is so phenomenal. And I'm not just saying because I wrote it and, and we <clears throat> produced it, but um, when I start talking about what's inside a little bit, it's it's almost unbelievable. I mean, this is a saga that's uh, several different family. It's, it's, it's multi-generational. It's several different eras in American aviation and motor racing history. Um, you know, there's uh, there's egos involved, and there's uh, disappointments, and there's uh, huge wins, and there's battles between uh, some of the legends of the Porsche world. Um, 
for territory and for money and for, I mean, it, it really could be a, 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 an extended miniseries because of the kinds of characters that are involved. We, yeah, I kind of, yeah, I agree with you. I kind of hope it is someday. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Whether it's based sure. on your book series or not, the whole, the whole, the roller coaster ride of the Brumos saga is pretty awesome. Well, the highs it, are really high and the lows well, are pretty low. And most people know of it uh, from Hurley and Peter Gregg. Right. But the Brundage family, Brundage Motors turns into Brumos. Uh, they grew up in upstate New York in the Hammondsport, uh, village of Hammondsport, which is on the south end of, uh, Ke- Ke- not Cayuga Lake, uh, maybe uh, Cayuga, Ke- Cayuga Lake. And they were uh, close personal friends with Glenn Hammond Curtis, the aviator. And it was, so they have that in their background already. Whoa. And it was uh, Curtis who, after World War I, invites them to come to Florida to help him with the building of Miami Springs, Opelika, and Hialeah. And, and, and that's when they start getting more involved with uh, people in the car world. And um, uh, a beach racer named uh, Sig Hogdahl uh, comes to mind immediately. But then uh, they, were also, they also helped to set up the, all the supply lines for Pan American Airlines in South and Central America before we even get to the real car racing part. And then uh, Ira Brundage, uh, Hubert Brundage's dad, was, a, was one of the original hot rodders back in the 1930s, uh, was you know, doing all kinds of crazy things to his uh, 1930s-era Ford Coupes. And you know, so he gets this old Duesenberg out from behind somebody's shed, and he's going to hot rod it for the street. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, Give a hot rodder a doozy? Nice. Oh, and this, it turns out that this particular Duesenberg had come in second place in the 1931 Indy 500 with Fred <laughs> Frame driving it. And he's going to hot rod it. Uh, yeah, and it raced for several years until it was finally not competitive anymore, and they pushed it behind a shed like they used to do to all race cars. Yeah. So he's going to put a flathead Ford motor in it. So, And we have the letters in the book back and forth between his engine guy, who happens to be uh, named Anthony Granatelli Jr., Andy Granatelli, Mr. 500. And that's who he gets his uh, his uh, flathead Ford motors from. <laughs> right? Um, the, 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 uh, everything has this t- level of detail, right? Uh, oh. Every uh, facet has this level of detail. Well, what we're looking at are like basically 2,900 images of letters, mm-hmm. um, documents, r- receipts. You know, um, I mean. Oh, my goodness gracious. It's. Uh, you know, stock options, letters back and forth between Hubert Brundage and Porsche, where he's, you know, bad mouthing Max Hoffman and saying, you know, you need to give us the distributorship, and and uh, the amount of content that's here is this is an encyclopedia. It's not a book. A book is the wrong word. It's, it's not. A, a, this is not a book. It, Look it, at this. Yeah, it's really huge. Yeah, it's. But each uh, one of these. Each volume is, is, a, uh, a is about 500 <laughs> pages. Uh, the second volume is 500 pages. I think the first volume is maybe 490, and the last volume is 490. Oh, but God. it is encyclopedic. I mean, it is, it's not a Brumo story. It's the Brumo story. How on earth did you amass all the, I mean, this is an archive. It, it of, is. Of it is uh, truly the archive. Uh, you know, I was lucky in that, uh, well, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when we started this one, you know, I, I had done Hurley's book, and I talked to Mr. Davis about uh, about the idea of the doing imagery. A, some of these old photographs. Sorry to cut you off. Uh, oh, just, sure. Just absolutely breathtaking. Some of this old stuff. And, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so I had talked to Mr. Davis about uh, you know this the idea of doing this thing, and we we both kind of agreed that it would be about the same size of the Hurley book. And uh, he says, "Well, you know, you have to do a good treatment of the Brundage family." Okay. Well, I figured, because I'd seen some articles by a historian named Phil Carney, who did some nice work on the Brundages, and I thought, well, I'm going to have a hard time rewriting his work. And then, a few days later, three legal-sized boxes of materials came from the Brundages. They sent you their archives. They sent me all of their Whoa. archives. And, and some of this stuff goes all the way back to you know, the, 19, the year 1900. When you get access to something like that, do you even know what the hell it all is, or do you not, have not to just the, throw it all out on the carpet and at just? The, at the beginning, I, you know, I'm like, how does this go together? One box at a time. Just got to start yeah, picking stuff just start apart. Start going through it. Like a timeline. Uh, well, you know, gradually I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, and, and eventually, like the story would emerge. Oh. Right, like you start to see. You just ingest the information, and eventually. Yeah, and like 
there was one section of it that I couldn't quite get, and it turned out that it was another branch of the family living in Indianapolis who had more materials and more pictures that filled in some of those gaps that I wasn't getting that really you know, brought the story alive. Uh, and and then we start to get into towards the end of the Brundages and and how that whole thing plays out when Mr. Brundage passes away. And most people think that it uh, went straight to Peter Gregg because everybody knows Peter Gregg. It, and what really happened was that when the uh, when he passed away, uh, he was uh, the Porsche distributor for ten states in the southeast, and he was the Volkswagen distributor for for four states. Volkswagen bought back their distributorship. Porsche couldn't afford to at that point in time, so they reassigned it to a guy named Johnny von Neumann. No way. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so most people, of course, know Johnny von Neumann from Competition Motors sure. out here. Uh, Down wh- in Hollywood. Yeah. So w- the interesting part of that whole thing is that um, Hubert Brundage had several battles with Max Hoffman, uh, and it That's turned hilarious. out I just got to that page. Here, Competition it Motors. It turns right out there. that uh, Johnny von Neumann had many battles with. Uh, with Max Hoffman, uh, I mean, legal battles, some really oh. intense stuff. Uh, and we happened to find all of the documents that show it wow. from both uh, Brundages and from Von Neumann. Both sides. Oh, yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. And so when uh, Mr. Brundage passed away, rather than re-expanding Hoffman's uh, influence down from the Northeast down into the Southeast, they gave it to, Ho- to Von Neumann, which in, a, in essence was like a thumb in the eye to Max Hoffman. Yeah, yeah. Like I should say, like this guy sued you in California. We're going to bring him out on your coast now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing stuff. Then he he sells the dealership (laughs) to Peter. Always been politics. Apparently, politics have been around forever. Oh yeah, (laughs) yeah. So yeah. then he does what? Then he sells, because he doesn't want to have a dealership. He's only going to do distributing. So he sells the dealership to Peter Mm -hmm. Gregg. And if you look on about oh maybe page two ninety or so in there you'll see you're amazing. Young, you're as amazing as this book is. <laughs> you'll see young Peter Gregg being introduced to uh, to the community and the letter uh, is kind of right across uh, from him uh, where they're announcing that Peter Gregg now has the distributorship. So um, yeah, I, I mean, and and then of course we get into the the era of Peter and Hurley. And, uh, you know, everybody knows the story about how, uh, you know, Peter met Hurley at an autocross where Hurley was driving his Nikki 427 Corvette and managed to beat him, uh, you know, and, and Peter Gregg was hot stuff, you know. So for anybody to beat Peter Gregg, you know, and here's this 18-year-old kid driving a Corvette, you know, which is, which is handling-wise was essentially a truck, right? <laughs> and uh, end, yeah. But, you know, rather than letting his ego run away, he's like, wow, here's a kid who's really fast and obviously has enough money to own a really cool car. He might be the perfect racing partner. And, Is uh, this the one? Uh, that's, that's actually Peter Gregg's Corvette. That's when he first started. He was a, a Navy lieutenant. And in the 1960s, you know, back in the day of early NAS- NASA, when all the, uh, the astronauts, uh, used to the get astronauts the, all had Corvettes. The Apollo program. Yes, yeah, so uh, Mercury. Mercury that program, point, yeah. that's right. Mercury so program. Peter Gregg, of course, being a Navy guy, he had to have a Corvette. Oh, wow. That's yeah. yeah, so that's Peter Gregg in 1963. <laughs> Gosh. Um, and, and Hurley doesn't come along until like 1967, 68. But, um, so I, I'm assuming that the book is in chronological order. Oh yeah, I mean the the, ser- the series, this saga. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the first volume goes from the year. Crazy cross referencing, I guess if not. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 first volume goes from the year 1900 to 1969 and finishes with Hurley going off to Vietnam. Oh wow! And then uh, and there's Hurley's Corvette right there where your finger is. And that was a badass car. There's a whole story that goes along with that. Um, uh, uh, Hurley's mom had bought him a motorcycle for his high school graduation, a, I think a BSA 500 or something like that. And then one of their family friends uh, got hurt really badly on a motorcycle. So his, <laughs> well, they got to get rid of the bike. <laughs> yeah, so we have to get rid of the bike. So, so his mom says, Hurley, go find a, a nice car that you would like to have. So he goes to the Nikki Chevrolet dealer. And Nikki was like famous for their high-performance cars. Okay. And uh, so he goes to the Nikki Chevrolet dealer. And this is right in the fall of uh, 67 when uh, Corvettes are about to change body styles. So this car is kind of on sale, 
right? Well, a Nikki Corvette at that time was a 500 horsepower car, right? So uh, Hurley goes, he, he looks at it. He's 18 years old, right? He looks at it. He's like, oh, yeah, this is a cool car. This is the car I want. And he says, I'm going to bring my mom in later today to sign the papers. Whatever you do. Do not start that car while she's here. She cannot hear what this car sounds like. And, of course, uh, he follows through and he gets the car. And, you know, um, I talked to the guy who took those pictures. Uh, it took so me uh, all kinds of people to find those pictures of P- Hurley in his, in his Corvette. And a, he's, a, a friend of mine was just doing a car in a livery very similar to that. I wanted to send him the, the picture of that. I was like, you should just make a freaking uh, yeah. a, a, a tribute. This yeah. is a beautiful car. Yeah. But that's Hurley there right there? That's young Hurley, wow. yeah. Look at yeah. that. Look how you Looking at all the is. mid-century architecture in the background. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ranch houses and stuff. Oh, yeah. that's, I, that's what I grew up with. <laughs> Man, this is so cool. Yeah, but uh, the, the guy uh, who, uh, who took the Hurley Corvette pictures, uh, they were in the Corvette club, and he said Hurley had the baddest Corvette in all of Florida. Like, he said, Why? I had number two, just tuned but up? Hurley's was Big the motor? baddest. What was it? It was the Nikki. It was oh, the Nikki. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. What do you think about cars today? Like, what do you think about my, you know, the, 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 I'm thinking about the Mopar car. They're damn near a thousand horsepower and you just well, go I, in and sign the paper. No big deal. <laughs> right. No, I, I mean, it's obviously it's great in, in terms of their performance. And now they actually have the handling, you know, to match That's the horsepower. Point, yeah. Um, my brother had uh, a 1970 AAR Barracuda uh, when I was 16 and I was learning how to drive. That was one of the cars that I was learning on. That's and, a, uh, a handful to learn and, on. And occasionally my brother would be out of town for something and my dad would say, uh, hey, you want to go for a drive? And uh, <laughs> it so wasn't the dad the... sneaking out the son's car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's well, great. Well, my dad loved cars too, right? So, uh, so when I was 16, I drove both an AAR Cuda, which was a very cool car, in it because it, uh, it was a 340 with what was called a six-pack. And sure. that was uh, three progressive two barrels so you'd hit the gas and it would go from two to four to six barrels and you could hear the change oh, and right? you could feel it yeah oh really and, and here oh yeah. sure yeah so i drove that car and then uh the local dealer also had a plymouth superbird oh sure and uh my dad's like hey you want to go drive the superbird i'm like yeah <laughs> the superbird was the roadrunner but the plymouth right instead uh, of the, yeah so it had the it had the, the high wing yeah, yeah yeah it was like the daytona that's uh, the Dodge daytona, daytona. That's what I meant, yeah. yeah yeah so yeah i drove those both when i was 16 man yeah. Gee whiz, that's awesome. <laughs> I was test driving shit at the dealership, but my goodness gracious. The Cuda was awesome. The Superbird was a boat. <laughs> well, the regular Charger was, and then they put those extenders on yeah. At least the front cone was ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, I wouldn't mind cool. having one now, though. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we all would. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, so let's see. So we're, where are we? Where are we here? So that one ends in 69, and then okay. uh, volume two, which is over here, this is all the 1970s. So this is all the Peter and Hurley adventures uh, when Brumos was, like, dominant. Like, so, so this is when – forgive me, I'm a little bit younger. Sure. This is when, like, I would have started to hear probably about them. Yeah, this is uh, – The classic I mean, 9/11s. pretty much, yeah. I, I mean, most people who think of Brumos think of Peter and Hurley. Okay. And, um, and so uh, I, I should mention that Roger Penske did the forward for the first volume. Bill Warner of Amelia Island uh, yes. did the uh, forward for the second volume. And Patrick Dempsey did the forward for the third volume. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, he's cool, but the first two, <laughs> credibility wise. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> two guy, and then, the, and then the crowd pleaser. Um, um, is it because uh, it's the most, re- it's the most uh, contemporary? Uh, well, yeah, is there a because reason for uh, why you chose how they went. Yeah, well, um, Roger Penske is actually on the cover of the f- of the first volume. There, he's the guy driving the car. He is because uh, he drove I four saw this picture Brumos in the book in- inside the yeah. book as well. Yeah, because he drove uh, four the Brundages in 1961, um, and in uh, 61 Sebring he co-drove with Bob Holbert, who was another you know classic Porsche racer. Al Holbert was his. Was his son who won many IMSA championships, and of course, you guys probably know Todd Holbert. Um, and so, uh, but then, of course, Brumos, uh, Peter's Peter Gregg's era, Brumos made its name by beating the Penske team at the 1973 uh, Daytona uh, 24 Hours. You know, because the they were driving smash. the same cars, but everybody fully expected the Penske car to win. 
and it dropped out, and uh, Peter and Hurley went on to win, and that's essentially the race that made them famous. And so, um, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about the branding of Brumos and how pervasive it is, and who better to get to talk about branding than Roger Penske, for one, and then the fact that, uh, you know, he raced for them and then raced against them uh, in key moments of the of the Brumos lore, that was you know kind of key to our choice there for doing the uh, the forward. But what I find interesting is I'm at page 614 of well, it can't be the second book. They're numbered. <laughs> this is 614 total, right? Yeah, <laughs> Not yeah, yeah. Of this yes, book. that's correct. Yeah. Six yeah. Ten, I'm like I'm already here. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm halfway through everything when we pick up where I first started learning of them. Yeah, that's There's right. There's so much yeah. story before what I really know about. Like this is, people need to get these volumes so that they can have and just look at for years and years and years. Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. I mean, that's one of the coolest things about this whole story is that when you look at the what the Brundages did to form Brumos, it's a whole epic in itself before you even get to Peter Gregg. I mean, it's phenomenal what, what they the Brumos did. Brumos come for? It's from Brundage? From Brundage Motors. Brundage Motors, yeah, yeah. okay. That's yeah, cool. yeah. And even that was kind of an adventure because... Uh, because in 1955, they almost had, they had almost peeled away a distributorship from Max Hoffman for Porsches in the Southeast. And their investor, who was Glenn Hammond Curtis II, uh, and owned 51% of the company, said that he didn't think that America really needed another little German car. <laughs> <laughs> so then the Brundages and the spent, rest is history. So then the Brundages spent another three years trying to peel themselves away from Curtis. <laughs> I mean, the what drama the is just phenomenal. It's, it's amazing. really cool. Yeah, and it's, it was right on the cusp so many times of like just going away. Oh yeah, like yeah. Porsche itself almost. I guess. Oh sure, yeah, a lot of parallels. Yeah, and in fact, uh, uh, Volume Three talks about that. It begins with the fact that you know in the early '90s that Porsche itself almost disappeared and. And that's the reason they went to the supercar series, because that's the only series they could afford to race in. Isn't that something? Yeah. I, I don't know if you know about that. Like, when I was falling in love with it, driving the 993s at the dealerships and everything, they were letting me drive them because they were praying my dad would buy one. You know what I mean? Like, they really, there wasn't much left to them. I said, well, what else do they have? And I'm like, this is the only car we make now. I'm like, no, no, I mean, like, the, 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 the front engine ones. I'm like, no, we don't do that anymore. This is the only car we make right now. And we might not make that much longer. It was yeah. that crazy. It was that crazy. And it then was. the Boxster came out and the 996, and then everything kind of started to change. But it, yeah. was, it wasn't as overnight as people made it seem. Like, the Boxster came out and saved Porsche. I mean, it was a, there was a, there was yeah. a lot of uh, very a lot of struggle wishy-washy years. Yeah. 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 This is amazing. The, the, the sheer archive photography that is in this book, I thought I'd, you know, scoured for a lot of, like, <laughs> Brumos 911 photos, Brumos 59, all that shit. Yeah. The stuff that's in here is stuff I've we, never seen. We literally and have quality. I, I can't believe we literally have the best of all the best of all the uh, photographers from that period. We have Dave Friedman. We have Hal Crocker. Um, you know Leonard Turner. Uh, um, I mean the list goes on and on and on of the great photographers that we had. It's remarkable. Uh, and to tell the story because. Once again, you know, we didn't want to tell a Brumo story. We wanted the Brumo story. So, you know, it, I mean, it took some money, but if if it was to be found and we found it, we got it. You know, so, um, you know, our photo budget went a little high. Nope. <laughs> I'm sure. But nobody comes out with, uh, you know, the definitive uh, Brumos American icon in five years. I mean, this is it. This oh, is no, that, that wasn't this five years. This is the archive. That was two years. Um, because I sat down to write the very first word of this book on July 1st, 2019, and we had our laser print proofs uh, at Amelia this year in the middle of May. So, but I can tell you this, uh, I didn't years. do... Is this the only thing you've been working on for two years? Please tell me that. It's the Have only thing... Been obsessively it's just... It's not the only on thing this? I was working on. It's the only thing that I did. <laughs> like, I didn't go to the... I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go to the post office. I didn't go to the grocery store. I didn't do anything. <laughs> 20 hours a day, and that's... I well, mean, this is the result, then. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Were you that way with the Hurley book, too? No. No. I mean... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Hurley. Uh, we, um, I mean, Hurley's book, I was actually still writing stories for magazines and, and traveling around and stuff. But, uh, but once we got a hold of this, it was just like, we need to do it. And the first year was pre-pandemic. I, I was already in quarantine just from working. 
And when the when the the real quarantine started, I was just like, yeah. I'm already in quarantine. What difference? Right? Yeah. What difference does it make? I, I yeah, I don't know. I just anytime I've ever done layout for anything on small scale, it's it's overwhelming to do yeah. thousands of pages. I really, I really don't understand. I mean, like, I kind of think you might be a little nuts. This is amazing. Well, the, 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 the beauty of the book is Richard Barron's work. I mean, he, in my, he is the best. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he did Hurley's book also, and, and we just developed a really great rapport. Um, and so it's I also work together though, yeah. obviously it's so, not just one person. So, you know, we'd pile all the stuff into uh, Dropbox and then he's in Bainbridge Island, uh, Washington, and, <laughs> well, I'm, in, and I'm in uh, the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. But thankfully for Dropbox and Skype and all that kind of stuff, we actually worked very closely the whole way through. Awesome. And, um, and, and besides Richard, uh, my text editors were Betty Jo Turner, who was the editor of Porsche Panorama magazine for 40 years. Whoa. And probably has more face time with the Porsche family than any non-Porsche employee. Um, Randy Leffingwell, who has written over 60 books, probably at least 30 of them on Porsches, yeah. was one of my text editors. Handful and then, them here. And then Kerry Morris from here was my technical uh, and historic editor. Um, so I had really kind of an A-team of, of helpers, which was really phenomenal. Well, the result is here. This is amazing. Um, how, what do you, I mean, what the fuck do you do next? Excuse my language, but like, where the hell do you go from a project like this? Like, I would take a year vacation and then maybe switch careers. I don't know after this. Well, I do have another uh, book project that I've uh, started, uh, and it's uh, actually a very cool one. I'm really excited about it, but I don't want to talk about it just yet. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just give you one little teaser, um, and I'll give you one word. Antarctica. Oh, great. <laughs> well, it's going to be the aliens, then. We know that, obviously. <laughs> okay, I'll World give history you, and I'll the give, aliens, I'll give, you, I'll give you a second word, then. Portia. Wow. It's funny. I well, like yeah. the penguins. And, uh, and if you, and if it's a you, shame you didn't give it away. And if you Google those two words together, you'll probably get it. I think quick. you might you might put it together. <laughs> yeah. Man, um, this is amazing. This is amazing. Some of these photographs, like I think I, my dad was a commercial photographer. That's what he did. So I, I grew up around, you know, a lot of these photos have marks on them and things like that. And right. I, I grew up around stuff like that. And so whenever I see things from a certain era, like it really just, it morphs my own head back into a space <laughs> from another well, life, a past you know, life. Another part of the, of, of this adventure that was so cool is that, is that one, Br Jan Brundage is still alive, who is uh leaning over the car there in his jacket. Amazing. Um, and, uh, and, and was very helpful with stories. And the other uh, person is uh, Jack Atkinson, who uh, has the coveralls over there and is leaning over the car. And he, uh, most people know him as being oh, Peter. Oh, the back there. Yeah, so most people know him as being Peter Gregg's crew chief for all his great victories in the 1970s. But Jack actually started working for the Brundages in 1956. And he has a mind as sharp as a tack. And he, he and I would talk like two or three times a week, if not more, for a couple of years. Uh, and, he, I mean, he told me so many amazing stories about uh, the Brundage era Brumos and then the Peter Gregg era Brumos. And then he also sent me his, uh, his day planners for all those years and his race notes. Oh, my so God. So we have a lot of that stuff in the book. So, so again, we go back to this uh, referencing. So instead of just saying anecdotally this happened and blah, 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 he'd say, well, here it is on my day planner. It's right here. Yeah. Yeah. And here's what we ate for lunch and here's where we, yeah. Almost, totally. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Good grief. Yeah. Gosh, there's so, it, it's just, it, it, this harkens back to a time. Like I'm getting nostalgic um, as I look at this just because uh, I think of a <laughs> simpler time, you know, I mean, things are, <laughs> things are just so different. I'm looking at these race photos, you know, it's freaking road Atlanta and all these different places. It looks like, um, I don't know. It makes me nostalgic. I wish we were still there. I, th I think the moment I have to stop looking at this book, I'm going to be back in 2021 and, oh man, it's a handful. Yeah. You, well, get a, you get lost. Um, there's, you get lost looking at some of the photographs in here and some of the story and everything that's going on. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that's so cool about that era is that uh, Peter Gregg and his team and most of the other teams who were racing in that period 
would travel with the driver, the crew chief who would drive the truck, and then maybe two or three other guys for a race. And that was it. That was the Good whole team. grief. Right. So not like today. No entourage and everything right. else. No. Like, you know, you look at how many people it takes to run almost any kind of car these days, you know, and it's like. Well, each department has a team. Yeah. Let alone each team. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, that part right there is a really funny story. Uh, in 1976, uh, Peter Gregg took an offer from DM- BMW to run BMWs, which was already uh, like a huge thing. Uh, and so he uh, calls Jim Busby, who lives down here in uh, Balboa Island. Uh, he calls Jim Busby really late one night, and he says, uh, Jim, you're going to run my team next year. I'm racing for BMW. You're going to run the Brumos team. And uh, Busby's like, well, Peter, you know, I already have a team. And he goes, yeah, well, sell your car, and whatever you get for your car, that's how much it's going to cost to buy my car. And Busby says, well, what if I get $10 for it? He says, that's how much my car is. So, so Busby runs the Brumos colors for the whole year, and Peter pays him a victory bonus of $5,000 for every race he wins. Okay, so Busby is a, is a historically a hot rodder, knows engine stuff, and they build a badass car out of a car that Peter sends them. And uh, they beat Peter four times that year. Uh, Peter lost the championship to Al Holbert just by a handful of points. And it's largely because Busby beat them so many times. <laughs> in Ontario, they're battling back and forth. Uh, and you can see the pictures in there. They're battling back and forth. And Busby's behind uh, Peter Gregg. And he knows that the BMW gets tail happy when it loses weight out of the fuel tank. And eventually he, go- he lunges to go for the pass. And when he does do that, uh, Peter uh, kind of shuts the door on him a little bit. They they hit. They both go flying off course, and um, and Busby gets back on and wins the race. He he you know manages to. So at the very next race at Lime Rock, uh, Busby's up on the podium and they're you know doing the awards and stuff like that. And Peter Gregg comes out of the crowd and he says, "Stop, stop! I have something to say to Jim Busby." And Busby's like, "Oh no, I'm going to get fired. And they're going to do this stuff. Um, what's going to happen?" And uh, Greg gets up on the podium and he waves to his guys and they bring the door (laughs) up on the stage and they (laughs) hand it to Busby and then he gives him his check besides. (laughs) I mean, the the stories that are in this book are just phenomenal from from every era. I mean, they're just great, great things. And it's such an amazing group of characters. I guess that's it. Is there anybody in in in? T- t- I mean, is there anything compared to this today? Is there anything that we would look at today and say, "Oh, yeah, that's similar"? Well, I mean, I think probably the the only thing you could compare it to might be, you know, Carl Ludwigson's excellence was expected. Um, you know, uh, I think this is probably the only one for a team like this. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Will there ever be anything like it? Because it, you know, it was sort of like a royalty sort of a weird thing because it was the family and then there was the team and it was you know what I mean like that's sort of going away I mean Penske I guess was sort of similar in the same way but it's, not, not the, I mean the front it's so large these days as you mentioned you know each facet of a, of a car has a team you know like the tires have a team and the <laughs> yeah. and the software has a team and the uh, the monitoring the engine has a team and you know monitoring the tra- the uh, the transmission and monitoring the the suspension you know, they all have somebody who's monitoring that data and, and how it works together and all that. And um, Oh, know, God, all the telemetry is its own thing. Yeah. yeah you're right. The, the, the computer guy is its own thing. And when you talk to Hurley about driving those cars, he's like, we just got in the car. I mean, you know, Peter would set it up by making sure the torsion bars were set right or whatever, but then we went racing. That was that. You know, the car moved around. It flexed. It did this, did that. But, you know, much different. Yeah. Yeah, I don't a lot, know a lot of drive by happen. the seat of your pants in the old days. I mean, there was yes. a lot of cowboy. The guy, the driver really did a lot more than they do. To, not to take anything away, but <laughs> well, and you know, Hurley, Peter was great. Peter was a great champion, and a very fast driver. Um, but Hurley was a very special, very special talent. Uh, who you know, uh, in the nineteen seventy seven uh, Daytona twenty four, he drove. Let's see, he had two. Uh, Amateur co-drivers, and uh, Hurley drove about 18 hours of that race. Wow. And he drove the whole night. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah, including some time in you know bad weather, um, and uh, yeah, I mean you know he, <laughs> just the stories of, of Hurley driving at Daytona are phenomenal. Yeah, this is something you were into your whole life. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, cause... it's funny because <laughs> I I was into it in the sense of getting car magazines every single month and reading them religiously, but never ever thinking that I would be involved in any kind of way. And really? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I I relate to that a lot. Yeah. So I I tell people that I read car magazines like most people read comic books. You know, like I'm never going to be Superman. I'm never going to be Spider Man. But um, but I wish that I was. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Did you yeah. mean by that like, all right, well, I'm looking at these. I'm not going to drive a Ferrari Testarossa or whatever the car was at the time, but I can look at them in these magazines. Is that what you mean? Yeah. I mean, it I was, wasn't I was, real, real. Yeah, I was interested, but I never thought. Like for instance, I never. I'll tell you this story. Okay, so so I, I, I've been doing articles for a few years, and I was happy just doing that. I was, like, so excited to talk to people and take pictures and do these pe- short pieces and all that. And in the summer of 2014, a guy uh, who lives down here who has Peter Gregg's 1977, 934 and a half, says, you know, there's no book on Peter Gregg. Is that possible? Huh. And as it's his uh, own story is its own. Yeah. Roller and coaster. so I'm thinking, wow, that could be maybe my first big thing. So I try to do it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I try to get in touch with the Greg family. I'm nobody. And it's a controversial story. And it's a sore point in their lives and so on and so forth. So I never hear from them. So I go to the Classic 24 that fall and I meet Hurley. And I'm, you know, as most people would be, I'm kind of like, you know, he's a god and I'm just some dude who's taking pictures. So I kind of like hang back and don't talk to him much. And and then uh, I was doing a story later on about uh, a car that he had driven for Bob Hagestad out of Denver. And I told him what he was up to and he said, well, you know, I'll help you if I can. Um, and after like three months, no action was happening from the Greg side. And so I called him one day and I said, Hurley, you know, I, I really appreciate your time and your effort. Thank you very much, but it's not happening. So, you know, talk to you later. And he said, uh, well, nobody's done a book on me. And at that point, my jaw like hit my desk. I was like, uh, uh. You thought you were letting him <laughs> off the hook, right? You thought you were letting him off the hook. I'm like, hey, you don't need to pursue this any further. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, He might have been dragging his... <laughs> Feet on purpose. He's like, well, wait a second here. How come this guy's not asking me about a book? Yeah, and so anyway, um, you know, he opened that door for me, and and which was a phenomenal <clears throat> opportunity for oh, me. Good for you. And and changed my life. Really? But, um, oh, yeah, hugely, hugely. Good for you. Because but it, you know, but you were already a writer. Was it just that you didn't think you would do something of that? Every writer wants to write a book. Okay. But how many writers do write a book? And so for me, uh, one, I got to write the book. And then we get to a point where, okay, who's going to publish the book? Well, um, Motor Books and David Bull would be the obvious choices for books like that. Um, David Bull was having, as you know, he's passed, since passed away, but he was having a hard time because of his motorcycle crash, and Motor Books just wasn't really interested. And um, so, you know, we kind of banter about that for the summer. And at that year's Rent Sport, uh, September 2015, I go to talk to him and I say, you know, hey, Hurley, I don't know what we're going to do for a publisher. And he says, uh, well, you know, Patrick Dempsey's making this film about my life. And I just, I clicked and I said, we've got to have deal, books. Baby. Like if people are going to go to see a film, there have to be books Amen. waiting outside. So, hey, how hard can it be? Short answer, hard. Ah! <laughs> Um, but, um, I called Randy Leffingwell who said, call Ryan Snodgrass, who's done the 3.0, uh, turbo book and the 2.7 Carrera RS book. Mm-hmm. And he told me how he did it, uh, which was hugely helpful. And I just, uh, you know, I found some investors and we put it together and, you know, it was work, but, uh, but you did self publish it. it. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I did not know that. Yeah. And this one as well. And this one too, because once, once you've, you've made, you've once you've figured done it out. that and you've figured it out. Why would you I wanted cut? the control. Yeah. I wanted the control. Um, we the printing will be maybe December. No, after December. Uh, well, so next pr- year. Printing is done on these things. So now it's just a matter of getting the slipcases printed and done. Oh. So now you know. I I mean I, at this point I hate making predictions because I've made predictions so many times and then just got tromped on. 
but uh, but we're, uh, there's only there's not many things that can go wrong <laughs> that are left. Right. Yeah. Right? You've, you've, right. You've checked all the boxes. Yeah. Um, is it available for pre-order? Oh yes, absolutely. Oh great! Right now you can go on uh, www the Brumos book, uh, and you can pre-order it now. Uh, we're only making fifteen hundred copies of the three volume set. Oh wow, it's limited. Oh yeah, of course. And it then is. we're making <laughs> three fifty nine of the collector's edition, which includes uh, this thing here. Wow, you might want to look at that. I do because that has the signatures. <laughs> I think we got bubble juice on it. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that has the signatures of uh, besides Hurley. It has Jack Atkinson, Jan Brundage, Roger Penske, both of Peter Gregg's uh, oh, wives. Oh wow, uh, what a cool thing. Yeah, yeah. So we got oh, all the what signatures a cool thing. of, uh, yeah. And you, you know, I mean, um, you're never going to find a place where ja- Jack Atkinson and Roger Penske and Jan Brundage and Hurley That's Haywood and all those people and <laughs> Jim Busby and Dan, where they've all uh, signed all that stuff, um, just not available anywhere. Wow. And then uh, that book has uh, some some uh, pictures which, which weren't included. Then. It has, <laughs> but wait, there's oh, more. <laughs> oh, we, you think I'm crazy? So uh, we have uh, a, a page with all the owners, and then you go a couple more pages, and we have a section. Oh, this is great! All the Brumos door numbers. All the all Brumos the numbers. <laughs> uh, so they 59 is the most famous, but they race with a lot of different numbers. Then we have a section on drivers, where we have all the drivers from every era. From the Brundage era through the uh, Peter Gregg era through the Deborah Gregg era through the modern era with Dan Davis, then we Be get to, then we get to the crew members and we have crew members from every era, then we have cars from every era. Um, it's like a, it's like a like a yearbook. Oh yeah, high school yearbook. Yeah, yeah. So that so that's what uh, that's what comes with the uh, with the collector's edition, and then uh, the first ten of the collector's edition, the slipcases are wrapped in uh, painter's canvas, and uh, those are going to be hand painted by some uh, selected automotive artists. Oh wow! Yeah. But wait, then you oh, but the case uh, it's a separate. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. You know, okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and, like, uh, you can't unwrap it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and some of the no, artists that, that we have, uh, that I don't want to talk about that yet, but some of the artists that we have online for that are some very notable artists, not just from the automotive world, but from the pop art world. Oh, wow, um, cool. Yeah, and those those items will be Did you bid. hear that? He just said Banksy's doing one. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it. You heard it here first, folks. Get those orders in now. <laughs> well, if it were true, I'd have to deny it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is just the coolest. So it's not so much an addendum. It's more like a, it's, I don't know, it's like a special. Why oh, yeah. is this special? Because it feels special. It does it, feel special. Well, because you're just not, you're not going to find that, right? I mean, yeah, there, that's cool. all the info. Like, very cool. These tell all the story and those tell all the players. It's like all the baseball cards in one book, you know? That's right. It's that, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, this may be a silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are you uh, proud of this? I'm I'm intensely proud of this. I was very proud of the Hurley book, uh, and it stands by itself. But uh, this, uh, uh, you know, to one to be asked and granted the opportunity uh, to tell the full Brumo story, and then do it in a way that uh, makes all the Brumo team members and uh, people. Uh, proud uh, to me that's you know I, I mean I I won't quit but I almost could quit after doing this one and say got it but um, that's why I was asking you before I was like what the heck? where do you go like where do you you almost have to go back to the drawing board and start something new because I don't <laughs> anything else is going to seem like a children's cartoon book to you <laughs> right yeah no I hear you what's I the total pages what's once we get to this um, one, it, so the three volumes that it comes to 1496 and yeah, then that's another but then, plus this and then that's another 96 <laughs> wow so almost 1600 pages yeah 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 that we did that Richard and I did in less than two years <laughs> what on earth did you sleep no <laughs> do you drink? Do you smoke pot? What, what were you no, doing? I, I mean, this is amazing. No, I, I, I worked. I, I mean, wow. you know, if I woke up at, if I went to bed at eight because I was exhausted from the day, I, I would usually wake up at ten thirty and go, ah, 
I know. Got an know, idea. Yeah. Yeah. And then sit down. Yeah. And and fortunately, the, I had enough of documents and photos and, and everything, and stories from, you know, people who were on the team that essentially the story told itself. I mean, I had to craft it. I had to make it readable. But um, that's, but that's the, a but lot of work really there, man. It's a lot of work and wrangling all that info. Yeah. Editing. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much you edited. There's 1,600 pages here, but I can't imagine boxes and boxes and boxes of going through all that stuff going, yes, this, no, not that, yes, this. I don't know that we said no to very much. It's, it's all pretty interesting, too. And it's all part of the story. That's the thing. You're telling yeah. the story, so it's all part of it. Yeah. I mean, to find a letter with Andy Granatelli's signature on it, you know, from 1947, I'm just like. And then we all get to see it. And then yeah. we all get to share it. Yeah, it's all in there. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you should be intensely proud of this, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for spending some time with us, too. Oh, thank you for having me. How, how was this experience for you? <laughs> oh, this was fantastic. You know, I, I have to tell you that I, uh, uh, who turned me on to this originally was Mark uh, from Florida. Oh, um, Mark Probonic. Mark Probonic. Oh, I love him. Yeah. Big fan. Yeah, and he's like, because I was, uh, you know, I, he's much more attuned to the world of social media than I am. And he says, oh. You know, late night place. So you got to be there. Yeah, it's the pretty girl and the guy with the desk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We totally enjoyed having yeah, you here, no, and I'm fun. hoping Fantastic. that when you're in LA, this will be a stop for you. We don't have to talk about the book. We can just shoot the shit. We can just talk about life and whatever. I'd talk about your airline flight and all the other things <laughs> and the bullshit stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, with this other project uh, that I'm starting to work on now. Um, I'd like to bring along the uh, driving force in that project. So. That would be great. Yeah. Speaking of which, you almost brought back a, a driving force today. You almost brought somebody uh, with you today that would have been a total shocker. Yeah, yeah. Didn't was, happen, but who would it yeah. have been? Uh, well, Hurley's in town. Um, <laughs> he's doing a bunch of stuff with Patrick Long for Porsche this week. Yeah. Um, and uh, New car they're driving, I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, we had talked a couple of weeks ago about it possibly happening, and and I sent him an email uh, yesterday with all the info, and he's like, no, I'm sorry. I'm just like, they've got me doing too much stuff. And, and this is right in the middle so, of the day, too. Yeah, um, yeah. That would have been fun, but know that you're welcome here anytime. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's great. It was really great to meet both of you, too. I feel the same way. My belt buckle matches your hat. I didn't want to say it the whole time, but it totally does. It totally does. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. How do people follow you? How do people – visions of power on Instagram. Yeah, visions at visions of power uh, or hashtag. I don't know. Is yeah, it, is it at or <laughs> hashtag? I don't Follow know. everything, folks. So visions, visions of power, power. on uh, Instagram, Sean Cridland on Facebook. Uh, I think it's visions of power on Twitter also, although I don't use that too much. Um, and then of course my website has all of my publications as PDFs, uh, except for the books, and it has links uh, to where you get the books, um, direct links. So um, if you're this one's brumosbook.com. Uh, yeah, thebrumosbook.com. Thebrumosbook.com. Yeah. Uh-huh. But all your other stuff you can get through your... Oh, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, you just go... Uh, and, I, and I, you know, because I did a thing uh, for Panorama on Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars getting coffee a few years ago. I did the first uh, comparative... Wait, I've, I've, not only did I read that, I loved it. It was uh, it was specifically the Gary Shandling episode, Yes, right? that's right, yeah. He's yeah. incredibly special. Gary Shandling was incredibly special to me, both of us, but me. And that article, I always wondered if I could get a PDF of it because I wanted to have it Put yeah. out and framed. I thought oh. that was a great, great, great article. I loved oh, it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I loved um, it. I bootlegged the uh, the very first comparative road uh, test of the 918 with the Carrera GT. Mm -hmm. um, did that for Excellence Magazine. Um, I had a friend. What do you mean you bootlegged it? Well, I had a friend. I, I wasn't assigned it. Oh, you just wrote it and, and turned it in? I had a friend He's in Santa Fe. on the Sa fax team. I had a friend in Santa Fe who, ha who had put down a full deposit on a 918. And uh, from the time I found out, I hounded him every single month with either a call or an email. Is it and, in yet? Uh, is it in yet? And then one <laughs> night he calls me and he says, I got it. And I called my other buddy who I had on the line uh, who has a career at GT. And I said, what are you doing tomorrow? And we went up in the uh, Jemez Mountains above where I live in New Mexico. And we shot the picture and I sent it in. And, uh, and everybody's like, how did you do that? Like, you know, we were planning to do I'm like, yeah, well. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did it. Put your pencils down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, when I first started, I didn't get assignments, right? No, people were like, yeah, that Cridlin guy, whatever. And so I would just find stuff to do myself. 
I think you're fascinating, and I feel like we've just scratched the surface. We talked all about this book, but I, I really want you to come back sometime, and I just oh. want to talk about you. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to just get to know you. I think you're awesome. No problem. <laughs> yeah. All right, what are we doing this weekend? Uh, well, we don't know yet. Tomorrow, GBBC, and Saturday, there's a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to be everywhere. See us somewhere. <laughs> we'll see you. Well, we'll see. Are we going to see you tomorrow at the Breakfast Club, too? Possibly. For Possibly. sure, Saturday. Okay. Yeah. Saturday at the Christmas party. Yes. Holiday party. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> also, there was viewer mail. I was going to talk about it because it was kind of funny because I got a package from the Malibu kitchen. <laughs> Not how you think I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just do this real quick. Uh, Susie sent a package from the Malibu kitchen. Susie from the Malibu kitchen sent a package. And the irony, folks, is that it's actually it's a shift knob for our Porsche. It's from her brother. But it was, it's, a, it's like a machine part. It looks pretty cool, and I think I'm going to put it in, especially now on the new GT3 shifter, just to see how it feels. But it's pretty cool, and I wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much to Scotty and Susie. We love you very much. <laughs> shame, we, shame you had to send it. We don't see every Sunday anymore, but uh, I'm grateful for it. It's very cool. Pretty nifty. Wow, that's heavy very as hell cool too. Now. So nice no, weighted... is this a flask? Is there something? No, <laughs> I thought so because I was unscrewing it, but it's just a two-parter. <laughs> it looks like it should be. Uh, I love you. We love you, Sean Cridlin. Well, thank you. I love both of you. We all love you at home. Please love one another, and um, we'll see you out there this weekend. But please love one another. It's getting crazy out there. Everyone's fucking in charge of what they know best, and blah. just hang in there. There's more that brings us together than divides us and and it seems like everyone's trying to focus on the opposite these days don't be had don't be had we're all really the same so i love you please love one another see you later (laughs) soapbox over